Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. Our goal in this segment is to take the first important steps toward your mastery of the first part of glycolysis. Glycolysis involves uh, enough different steps that we understand in enough detail that we're going to break it in two pieces. So let's first put glycolysis in context, and then I'll talk to you about the two pieces, the first of which we're going to focus on today. So remember the overall context of metabolism. So uh, organisms are vehicles built by design information, and that design information in turn builds the plethora of tools that are necessary to allow the organism to exist. And among those tools, a large fraction of them are catalysts, which catalyze the flow of matter, fuel, through the animal's body or the human's body uh, over time. The rapid flux of uh, matter through your body uh, in the form of uh, the, the nutrients you take in as food and the waste that you excrete as feces and urine, for example. That sort of massive flux of matter through your body. That is called metabolism. And our goal in this segment and the next several segments is to begin to talk about the details of that, having put it in context in the preceding segment. So let's put glycolysis in context. So this uh, image represents the sort of core of all animal metabolism. Almost all pathways in the animal either emerge from or feed into the central core metabolic pathway. And what, as we go through it uh, in the next several segments, uh, I want you to be conscious of the f profound simplicity of this pathway. So think about what's going on here. Billions of times a second, molecules are fluxing through this central core pathway, either on their way to being consumed to generate energy or on their way back out again to build building block molecules. But what, as you look at the, the carbon fluxing through these core pathways, I want you to notice its fundamental simplicity. That is, every molecule fluxing through here on a millisecond time, base, time uh, scale, rapidly fluxing through, but each of these molecules uh, being burned as fuel or being used to assemble structures is typically no bigger, has no more atoms than you have fingers and toes. It's ultimately uh, quite simple. And by understanding the fundamental principles behind this simple chemistry, how matter and energy flow through this process, we get a much deeper grasp of the fundamental chemistry of, of all of life. It's, w there are a lot of really general lessons to be learned from this metabolic understanding these metabolic processes. And again, let me re-emphasize, re watch for the simplicity, the fundamental simplicity of this central core crucial process. So we're going to focus in this segment and the next one on glycolysis before moving down to the rest of the core metabolic pathways in later segments. So remember what glycolysis is going to do. It's going to transform uh, uh, spent currency molecules like oxidized NAD and ADP and it's going to regenerate, reduce NAD and ATP, high energy currency molecules. Those currency molecules recharged can go out and participate in anabolism, in building new structures, maintaining existing structures. The first part, glycolysis, that we're going to focus on is catabolic, but it's generating reactive currency molecules, high energy currency molecules, to support anabolism. It's also true that anabolic processes will occasionally reach into glycolysis and pluck carbon skeletons out for other uses. We're not going to talk about that here. We'll talk about that later, the anabolic use of the carbon that glycolysis generates. Here we're going to be concerned with a catabolic generation of high-energy compounds in support of that anabolism. Okay, let's put this in spatial context. Remember that uh, the animal cell can be divided into a variety of compartments, but there are two that concern us here. One is the broad aqueous compartment in which the rest of the cell's organelles are embedded, called the cytosol, and then the mitochondrion. So, in fact, glycolysis that we're going to focus on goes on in the cytosol, and as we'll see in later segments, the products of glycolysis feed into later metabolic processes, which are going to go on in the mitochondrion, but we won't be concerned with that today. We'll be concerned with the cy cytosolic a glycolytic process. So let's now blow up glycolysis. This is a very undetailed diagram. Let's blow it up and look at the details. It's convenient to separate glycolysis into two halves. So going uh, top to bottom and left to right is the entire process of glycolysis. And we split it into the first half, which we're going to talk about today, and the second half, which we'll talk about in the next segment. Notice that uh, uh, glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, abbreviated GAP here, is a product of the first half, which then feeds into and initiates the second half. Okay? All right. So it's convenient to break this uh, glycolysis into pieces this way, in part because they're functionally distinct. 
So the first part involves the burning of ATP to create phosphointermediates. Uh, you're losing energy, in other words. You're investing. But then the second half recovers uh, ATPs in excess of the, the amount that you invested in the first half. So and it looks like from this diagram that you invest uh, a two in the left part and you recover two in the right part. But that's slightly misleading. Notice that at the bottom of the first half that um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is uh, in equilibrium with dihydroxyacetone phosphate, uh, abbreviated DHAP here. And so the 6-carbon glucose is actually transformed into two 3-carbon units. And each of those three carbon units separately goes through the second half. So in fact, you have to multiply everything that's on the diagram here by two. So in fact, you invest two in the first half of glycolysis, ATPs, and you get four back out. So it's a good business proposition. 100% profit works pretty well. Again, our focus today will be on the first half of glycolysis. And then in the next segment, we'll return to all the lessons the second half has to teach us. So let's click through the reactions, the few reactions that make up the first half of glycolysis. There are just a few. The molecules are simple. The reactions are comparatively simple. Let's click through them one at a time and look at some of the lessons they have to teach us about how organisms burn fuel. Automobiles, internal combustion engines, burn it one way. Organisms burn it a different way. But the underlying outcome is the same. You start with reduced hydrocarbons, and eventually, at the long end of metabolism, you've oxidized them all the way down to CO2 and water. We're going to take, in glycolysis, the first few steps down that sequential oxidation pathway. All right. So this is, again, the first half. And let's zero in on the first step, the so-called hexokinase step. So this starts with glucose. So glucose is the form in which um, um, most of the energy circulates in your blood, so your muscles are using it, your brain is using it. This is blood sugar. This is, the, this is what drives a lot of the metabolism in all of your cells. So when we look at glycolysis, remember it's going on full tilt every millisecond in every cell in your body to provide, sustain the energy, most of the energy that you're going to use. Some other molecules contribute. We'll come to that later. But glucose is always a central uh, uh, source of energy and burning it through glycolysis is the first step in accessing that energy. So the very, very first thing you do is put a phosphate on it. And the enzyme is called hexokinase because it literally takes a hexose, glucose, and puts a phosphate on it, doning, uh, don that phosphate being donated by ATP. Let's go back and remember the the thermodynamic logic of this reaction. This is a set of images you saw in the preceding segment when we talked about the thermodynamic logic of metabolism. I want to now show you that it is, in fact, a real case that a real enzyme actually uses. So you can divide this reaction into two halves. Putting a phosphate on glucose, which you'll notice at, uh, with the accounting at the right, is an energetically unfavorable thing to do. It has a free energy of plus 13.8 kilocalories, very unfavorable uh, reaction. But you can couple that with a hydrolysis of ATP, which has a free energy change of minus 30.5 uh, kilojoules per mole. I'm sorry, I said kilocalories a moment ago. Kilojoules per mole. And in fact, therefore, a very exergonic reaction, very favorable reaction. So by editing out the superfluous bits, you can see the underlying logic of what the enzyme is going to do. It's not going to do these two half reactions separately. It's going to start with ATP and glucose, and it's going to couple those reactions. And when it does that, transferring a phosphate directly from the high energy glucose, I'm sorry, high energy ATP directly to glucose is going to uh, achieve phosphorylation of glucose at a net negative free energy. In other words, a very favorable reaction. The reaction is going to go forward from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, the first step in driving the directionality of glycolysis. So let's look at how the enzymes actually do this. So this is, uh, uh, again, the reaction. Notice ATP. This is our old friend ATP. Remember that the uh, 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 alpha-beta and beta-gamma bonds are anhydride bonds, very high energy. In fact, the gamma phosphate is going to be donated from ATP, covalently transferred directly to glucose in this coupled uh, reaction. So in the diagram that you're going to see, we're going to take ATP, and it's just going to be flipped 180 degrees this way, mirror image, and the uh, adenosine nucleotide uh, part of the molecule is just going to be written out. So there you see it at, uh, at left, the ATP molecule now projecting back the other. <laughs>